All right. Well, thank you for joining us for yet another uh, RAN webinar. Um, we're excited for this one. We know the the further we go down the rabbit hole of wonky water policy, um, the further disconnected that policy can seem from the birds and the habitats that inspired the Western Rivers Action Network to take action in the first place. Um, so we're excited to be bringing it back home to, to birds and habitat on the ground. Uh, to help us do that, we have Osvel Inafosa Huerta, um, Director of Pro Natura Noroeste Bay's Northwest Water Conservation Program. And he's going to be talking to us about the ecosystem response to restoration and birds in the Colorado River Delta. So with that, I pass it on to you. Sarah Offal. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can. You sound great. Okay, thank you so much. And thanks everybody for for joining us, um, going to run through this presentation. And I think in the end, there's there will be some time for, for questions. Um, and I'm going to talk about the restoration work in the Delta and how it relates to birds. There is some water policy in there, but also a lot about what are we doing on the ground and how birds are responding to it. Uh, next one, please. And just a little bit about Pronatura Noroeste. We are a nonprofit organization in Mexico. We do environmental work throughout northwestern Mexico. And this is our mission, the conservation of the priority ecosystems of northwestern Mexico, contributing to the development of society in harmony with nature. Our headquarters are in Ensenada, Baja California, but we have offices throughout northwestern Mexico from Nayarit, Sinaloa, Sonora, and the Baja California Peninsula. And for the Colorado River Delta program, we have an office in San Luis Rio, Colorado. Next one, please. And this is the, the region that we're going to talk about today. Uh, I think that most of you are, are familiar with the Colorado River Basin. Um, uh, it, it's it, it's born in the Rocky Mountains in the state of Colorado and Wyoming. Uh, it runs about 2,600 kilometers from Colorado down to Baja California and Sonora in Mexico. Um, it serves about 36 million people and 2 million acres. And this is the region of the Delta in, in, in uh, the corner between California, Arizona, Baja California, and Sonora. So from the middle part of the slide and running down, you can see the Colorado River. And from the east, you know, from the right, you can see the Gila River coming from Arizona and joining the Colorado near Yuma. You can see a, a black line that delineates the border between US and, and Mexico. And to the left, you can see the Baja California Peninsula. And then again, down in the middle, it's the the upper Gulf of California. The far left is the Pacific Ocean. And you can clearly see the Mexicali Valley in, 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 in the Mexican portion and Imperial Valley in the US portion. And this is a very arid region, one of the most driest regions in the world, actually. We have basically no precipitation. So all of the water that, that comes here for human uses, for agriculture, for nature, it's water that comes from the from the Colorado River. Uh, next one, please. And as you can imagine, uh, with all of the development uh, in the Colorado River Basin, there has been a lot of changes. This is a map developed by a geographer, Sykes, in the 1930s, that shows the geomorphological extent of the delta. And as you can see, it includes from the Salton Sea down to the Gulf of California. So all of what now is the Imperial Valley and Mexicali Valley used to be part of the Delta wetlands, no? uh, streams, cottonwood, willow forests, mesquites, marshes, lagoons. So it was about a million acres. And all of the water from the Colorado River used to flow into the Gulf of California. So it created, uh, created an influence of about 50 miles into the sea, creating also this extensive estuarine area where the river mix with, with seawater, creating a, a, a very productive region in, in the upper Gulf of California. Um, next one, next one, please. And, and yeah, there have been 
drastic changes. Um, we have lost about 85% of these wetlands. They have been converted to agriculture just desiccated, but still we have today more than 100,000 acres of remnant wetlands in the Delta that are very valuable, very resilient, um, and that provides this uh, incentive and hope for restoration. So in this map in yellow, you can see the agricultural area of the Mexicali Valley. And cutting across the, the valley in green, it's the Colorado River floodplain um, and what we call the riparian corridor. And this is the area with, with um, very interesting potential for riparian restoration for cottonwoods, willows, mesquite. So most of it is it's, um, dominated by salt cedar and we get to that a little bit later. And to the west or to the left of the screen, you see the Hardy River. And to the right, in the bottom, you see the Cienega Santa Clara. And then in purple is the intertidal zone where these remnant flows connect with the tides of the upper Gulf of California. Next one. Now we'll just show you some pictures of those, some of those remnant habitats and where we are conducting some of the conservation and restoration work. This is a, a picture of the riparian corridor with some of those willows and some of that water in the river. Um, so even, even in, in its um, altered condition, there is there are some native forests there and they are increasing due to the work that has been going on. And there are portions in the, in the river that uh, have water, mostly from uh, subsurface flows uh, where groundwater is shallow. Next one, please. This is the Cienega de Santa Clara. It's the largest wetland in the Delta. It's uh, overall, it's about 40,000 acres. It has a portion of marsh and with cattle vegetation and lagoons, and then a southern portion with mudflats and shallow lagoons. And it's very interesting because it is maintained by agricultural return flow coming from Arizona. It's a very interesting it's a story on itself. We won't get to it much today, but uh, be happy to, to explain more any other time to anybody that is interested. Next one, please. And this is the Hardy River. It's, it's on the western side of the, of the Delta. Um, and the Hardy is maintained by agricultural return flow, but from the Mexicali Valley. Next one. And this is in the intertidal area. This is in Montague Island. And the vegetation you see is a native salt grass that uh, is endemic to this, to this portion of the upper Gulf of California. Next. And uh, so these um, habitats in, in the Delta, I think one of the, this is one of the important characteristics of the Colorado River Delta, that we have this diversity of habitat types in one region. No, from freshwater and riparian transitioning into uh, brackish marshes and then the intertidal area and then the upper Gulf of California. So it creates this richness for, for, for wildlife. Um, and it has been recognized. So in Mexico, it's uh, part of these wetlands are protected uh, under a biosphere reserve is the upper Gulf of California and Colorado River Delta Biosphere Reserve. It's a, federally protected uh, natural, natural area. And it's also a Ramsar site, a wetland of international importance and a priority wetland in Mexico and in North America. No? And one of the interesting aspects is uh, the Yuma Clapper Rail, the one you see in the picture, or Yuma Ridgeway Rail now with the taxonomic changes. Uh, it's a protected species, uh, both in Mexico and in the US. Uh, it's endemic to the lower Colorado and the Delta. And about 75% of the total population of the Yuma Ridgeway Rail is in the Cienega de Santa Clara. So it, it gives you a sense of the importance. No? And also these wetlands are uh, a priority in North America because of their value for migratory waterbirds. Every year we get about 200,000 migratory waterbirds um, coming to, to, these, to these sites. Next one, please. And so to to protect these sites and, and to improve with restoration, uh, a group of, or a coalition of uh, environmental organizations have formed uh, Raise the River. Um, and, and these are the partners, uh, Redford Center, 
National Audubon Society, Sonoran Institute, Restauremos el Colorado, The Nature Conservancy, and Pronatura Noroeste. Next one, please. But it's very important to mention that this is all of the, the results in the Delta are not only the work of the environmental organizations, it's truly a collaborative work across the border with uh, federal agencies, and state and municipal agencies too, um, academic institutions, uh, foundations, um, and, and communities. No? And so I, I think it, it's very important that it's a collaborative effort um, all around. Next one. And so we started this work about 20 years ago. And the first thing was to try to understand the system, document what uh, was left, and, and the interaction between the water, the vegetation, and the wildlife. And so that one, was one of the first efforts that we started. No? With the idea to create a very um, solid science background for, for planning the restoration vision. Next one, please. And part of that effort was the, the avian monitoring program that we have been implementing in the Delta. So I will just summarize a little bit of, of what, what this program is. So the, the mission uh, and, and the reason we created it was to uh, basically, uh, well, first develop an understanding of, of the birds in the Delta. There was very little information about the birds of the Delta when we started this work and also to evaluate the trends in abundance and diversity of, of birds as a measurement of ecosystem health and get information to guide conservation and restoration initiatives. Next one, please. And so the program, uh, what we have been doing is to, to study the floodplain of the Colorado River from Morelos Dam near Yuma down to the estuarine area and documenting the changes in abundance, diversity, and also the composition of the riparian avian community, but also the marsh birds, and trying to generate this understanding of the relationship of the birds with hydro the hydrology, surface and groundwater, and also with vegetation changes, and as well as restoration activities. Next one. Um, this is just to summarize a little bit of the technical aspects. What we have been doing in the riparian corridor are point counts, variable distance point counts, five minutes that are 200 meters apart. This is a very standard procedure to monitor birds in riparian settings. And we have 192 survey points in 24 transects that we have been monitoring uh, four times per year, once per season. Uh, now we are concentrating more during the breeding season to, to get better resolution on, on the resident and breeding birds. But we have been doing this since 2002. And also we're adding transects where we are implementing restoration sites and we'll get to that a little bit later. Next one. Just a map showing where we have uh, the, the surveys across the riparian corridor. And then also on the Hardy River and in the estuary, down in the in the Hardy and the estuary, they are more um, oriented towards water birds, and in the upper portion in the Colorado is more about uh, well, all birds with an emphasis on riparian land birds. Next one. And also, we have been monitoring marsh birds. Next one. Um, so we are following a standardized protocol for monitoring marsh birds in North America. That is its use. Canada, United States, and Mexico. And basically it's because these birds are not well detected with standardized point counts. They don't, uh, you don't see them very often. They don't get out of the cattails uh, and they don't vocalize that often. Uh, so you, don't, you need to play the, re the recordings and then they respond and you count them. No? And this is to monitor black rails, sodas, these bitterns, beginner rails clapper rails or bridgeway rails and American beaters. So, and we do them during the breeding season, March and May. And also we have been doing this since 2003. Next one. Uh, we, we do have point counts in the Colorado River, but a lot of the effort is again in the Cienega Santa Clara because of its importance down there. Next one. And so what we have learned is that the, the delta is very important. No? We talk about the, the clapper rails in the Cienega Santa Clara. Uh, we talk about the water birds in migration, but uh, we learned that we have a lot of riparian breeding birds, no? like vermilion flycatchers and yellow-breasted chats in, in the riparian corridor, and also 
uh, a big influx of uh, neotropical migratory land birds during the spring migration that use the delta as a stopover site. Next one. And so, in addition to the to the to the bird studies, there's been a lot of uh, amazing research on the geomorphology, surface and groundwater hydrology, and vegetation that has created this uh, understanding to guide uh, decisions on how to approach restoration. Next one. And the, and we have been working really hard over the years to, to build consensus of what restoration is in the Delta. So we're not trying to restore the Delta to what it was a hundred years ago, but rather to um, optimize the benefits that we can obtain in this region. So this is the, the vision that we have created for the Raise the River Partnership, uh, native biodiversity and human communities in the Colorado River Delta will be sustained by a landscape scale network of hydrologically functional adaptively managed conservation sites and corridors supported by public policies and programs in both Mexico and the US. Next one. And this is a summary of the key strategies of what we're doing on the ground in, in the restoration of the Delta. One and, and that is, is first and, and very important is to conduct this research, uh, do the planning and consensus building of how to move forward with restoration and then monitor, see results and repeat. No, we see this as an, you know, in an adaptive management context. And then another very important uh, strategy and activities, uh, the outreach and community involvement. If we want to, to have success in the long term, we think that, that there should be a very strong uh, community involvement component. And then also we have been working on the public policy on both US and Mexico and then in binational negotiations. And then also securing water for the environment through different mechanisms and we'll get to that. And protection of the key sites, for us it's very important that it's not only about securing the water and allocating the water, but that the sites are protected in the long term. And then the active restoration um, activities. Next one, please. So just to talk briefly about uh, how can we allocate water uh, in, in a river like the Colorado, where we know that the, the river is over allocated, every drop of water has an owner in both US and Mexico. So we figured out that we needed new strategies and tools other than just asking the governments to provide water for the environment. Next one. And what this means is, uh, these four mechanisms that, that we have been following. One is to secure that those agricultural return flows continue to reach and maintain these wetlands, both Mexican return flows and, and US return flows. Another of the important mechanisms is the acquisition of water rights in the Mexicali Valley. Uh, another one is to secure treated effluent of wastewater plants um, and also to optimize the tidal interactions, especially in the lower part of the Delta. Next one. So to get into a little detail of, of uh, those strategies, uh, this is an example, La Serenita's wastewater treatment plant that uh, treats water from the city of Mexicali. It's about 30 kilometers south of Mexicali. And in 2008, we, the NGOs, we signed an agreement with the state government of Baja California to secure 30% uh, of the effluent as in-stream flow for the Hardy River. So it has uh, helped to improve flows into the, into the Hardy River. Uh, next one. Uh, but also uh, part of, the, of that collaboration allowed for the creation of uh, an artificial wetland. So in the left, you see uh, the plant when it was being created and you can see the the square or the rectangles, that's the treatment plant. And on the, on the right, you can see the plant functioning, but also the, the wetland. It's a 250-acre wetland. It's called the Sarenitas Wetland. And our partners on our institute has been leading the implementation of, of this project. Next one, please. And this is a picture of La Sarenita. So it's a beautiful site. Uh, so some people have a, a hard time, you know, it's, uh, believing that this is in, in Mexicali. And we have been doing bird counts uh, here since 
you know, since since day one when water started flowing there. And you know, in the first the first survey, we only have a, a dozen birds from five species, and now we have detected over 160 species, and the maximum count on a single day was over 20,000 birds. So it's been working pretty good as, as bird habitat. Uh, we get a ton of shorebirds, especially phalaropes, redneck phalaropes, uh, but also ducks, uh, a lot of northern shovelers. And one of the cool things is that uh, some uh, of the priority birds have uh, already nest, are already nesting in this area, including the Ridgeway rail, uh, Virginia rails are nesting here and least bitterns. Uh, but also birds that are not so common as, as breeders in this region as western grebes and cinnamon teals and mallards. So it, it's working pretty cool. Next one. And because it's relatively close to Mexicali, it's also a great place uh, for environmental education and bring students and the general public to talk about bird habitat, restoration, the value of wetlands. So it, it's been working pretty cool also that way. Next one. So on that on that topic of, of um, fresh water allocation and that strategy of acquisition of water rights, uh, this is something that we have been implementing since 2008. And basically it's a voluntary market-based strategy. What it means is that we acquire water rights from willing farmers in the Mexicali Valley. There is a, there is a market for water rights in the Mexicali Valley and we figure out that we could enter that market and, and recover water for, for environmental restoration. So we, we form the coalition of NGOs. We form a water trust for the restoration of the Colorado River Delta. Next one, please. Which now has transitioned in, into the creation of this uh, organization that we call Restauremos el Colorado, which is in charge of managing the water rights and continue with the acquisition and securing more, more water for restoration and also implementing some of the restoration projects. So it's, again, a partnership of the, uh, of the environmental organizations. And um, uh, to date, we have secured a permanent allocation of 8,200 8, acre feet per year. Next one, please. And so how, how does, does this work? Uh, try to, to summarize it. This is an infrared picture of the Mexicali Valley and in the center is the floodplain of the Colorado. The, the polygons or um, in, in green are areas where we're doing restoration. So how it works is that a, a, a piece of agricultural land has a, a water right. Um, one hectare, which is about 2.5 acres, has an allocation of 10,000 cubic meters, which is 8.1 acre feet. Uh, and, and that water can be separated from the land and move anywhere within the Mexicali Valley, the irrigation district. And we can move it also into the river in places where we have secure land through concessions. No? The federal floodplain, the floodplain is federal land, and, and so we can obtain concessions to do restoration, and that's where we have been landing or, or water rights. Next one, please. So now moving into the, the restoration in, in this floodplain and how, what is this vision for restoration? So this is a, um, like a summary of how we envision uh, this, this work. We're not trying to reclaim any of the agricultural area, but rather improve the, the floodplain, which it's very fortunate that the geomorphology of the floodplain in Mexico has been maintained. So that's a great basis for, for restoration. So, we we see as having a main stem uh, of the Colorado River and then a zone one, which is kind of the wettest vegetation uh, with marsh, cottonwoods and willows, and then a zone two, which is the mesquite forest. Zone three, a little bit more upland vegetation with palo verde and other species, and then zone four, the agricultural area. Next one, please. Um, just another scheme to, to another figure to, to show you what, what I'm talking about you now with the, the river into the far left on the top image and then that transition from marsh, cottonwood, uh, willow, cottonwood and mesquite. And the bottom part is a little bit of what, what we were trying to achieve. Next one. And where we are implementing restoration, there is a ton of uh, planning and design. Uh, based on a series of, of uh, characteristics. Uh, 
the soil types, salinity, groundwater conditions, uh, existing infrastructure, also so social and legal aspects. No, so uh, where we are doing, uh, or where, where we're going to do restoration work, there is a lot of, of planning and design. Next one. And just to show you some pictures of before and after, no, as, as we talk, uh, the floodplain, a lot of it is dominated by salt cedar, like in this picture, this is a site before restoration. Next one. And this is a site that has already been restored with cottonwoods and willow. This is the uh, Laguna Grande region, um, also managed by the Partners on Oran Institute. Next one. And just a summary of the work. Um, it starts with the removal of salt cedar. We use also heavy uh, machinery for to do this, but one of the things that we have been trying to do uh, in the multiple sites managed by Pronatura, by Restauremos el Colorado, by Sonoran Institute is to create jobs for the local communities. So in any given time, we have about 90 to 100 people from the local communities working on restoration. So the first step is removing salt cedar. And we only remove salt cedar where we know that we're going to plant the native trees or where we're, we're going to do restoration. Otherwise, we don't remove salt cedar. Next one. And then there is also the work of grading and leveling, depending on, on what we're going to plant and how we're going to irrigate. Next one. Also, there is the production of native plants. Uh, so in Mexico, we don't have uh, a lot of commercial nurseries that produce cottonwood willows, mesquites, or other native species. So we have uh, two big nurseries now, one operated by Pronatura and another by Sonoran Institute where we produce about 150,000 trees every year that we're going to plant. And again, also, this is a source of, of uh, employment for people from the local communities. Next one. And then the planting, no? Once a site is prepared and protected and we know that we have water for this site, then there is the, the planting of the trees. Next. And this also creates a lot of opportunities for the community engagement and environmental education. So we create uh, campaigns or events where we bring, bring volunteers to help and plant the trees. Every year we have about 2,000 uh, volunteers coming to the restoration sites and help us plant, plant the trees. Next one. And it, you can see you know, the restoration is, is looking pretty good. It's one of the great things with ripe restoration that you can uh, really get results fairly quick so the cottonwoods and willows uh they grow to um to about 20 feet 30 feet in just three years so that's that's pretty cool um and, and you get you get that response from from wildlife in that time a frame also and it's great because the volunteers come back in the following years and, and they they see the the trees that have grown no so um so in addition to the planting and all of the preparation, we do irrigation and maintenance. And we, we have been obtaining great survival, uh, over 90% survival in the different sites of the, of the planted trees. Next one. And now uh, changing topics into the binational negotiations um, and how that has supported habitat creation. Next one. Um, so one of the, benchmarks no it was the signing of minute 319 in 2012 and i think this is really an historic agreement for the colorado river basin not just for the delta even though it was only five year five years i think it's it's uh it was um really it really helps change the direction of the basin in the sense that for the first time there is uh, that binational discussion on sustainability for the basin and water conservation and how to address shortage and how to address environment together. No? And also for the first time, the, it, there was a more open negotiation with participation of water users uh, on, from both sides of the border and also environmental organizations from by, both sides of the border. So Minute 319 included water conservation, uh, new water sources, how to address shortage and drought and an environmental component. And I'm going to concentrate on the environmental component. Next one. So this 
this uh, environmental component uh, consisted of the allocation of water for the delta. So there are about 260 uh, international basins or watersheds in the world. And this was the first time in which two countries uh, get together and agreed on an allocation of water for the environment in an international watershed. And the allocation was uh, 158,000 acre feet in the five year period from equal contributions from the US, Mexico and the NGOs. And part of the process of course was, was for restore, to restore the Delta, but also to test the delivery mechanisms, you know, to figure out if we could use the infrastructure to, to make these releases for environment and also evaluate the ideological and ecological response of the ecosystem to inform uh, restoration and the design of environmental flows in the future. Next one, please. And so that environmental component had two, two pieces. One was a pulse flow and a base flow. So a pulse flow uh, was the water contributed by Mexico and the US was 105,000 acre feet in one major event, a single event. And the idea of this pulse flow was to mimic the natural flow regime of the Delta to a certain extent. Uh, it was the water was released during eight weeks between March 23rd and May 18th of 2014. Next one. And then there is the base flow, which are 53,000 acre feet, and is the water provided by the NGOs and managed by Restauremos El Colorado. So these are smaller flows, but with longer duration. The idea of these, of these base flows uh, are to maintain the restored vegetation, uh, both at the uh, restoration sites, but also vegetation that has uh, been uh, improved by the by the pulse flow. Next one. So I will show you some pictures from the from the pulse flow of 2014. If you hadn't had a chance to see some uh, of those of these pictures, this is the opening of Morelos Dam, where the pulse flow was released. This is uh, on the Morelos Dam is on the Mexican side, very near Yuma, Arizona. And this is the, the, the beginning of the pulse flow on May 20, on March 23rd, 2014. Next one. And very fast, just like six, seven days later, where the, the, the water was being released, we got to see a, a river uh, running free and alive again. Next one. And we saw something that, that was expected, no? some of the lower terraces being flooded. And, and helping to green up those cottonwoods and willows that existed in that area. Next one. And we saw, as I mentioned, Noah, a river back again and, and people was eager to get on, a, on the boats really, really fast. Next one. Yeah, like, like, like here. Next. And just to give you an extent you know, or uh, the magnitude of how much water we had, we had during the pulse flow. Next. And an important part of, of the post flow was the science. So there was a, a lot of people on the ground during the post, well, before, during, and after the post flow, looking at the surface hydrology, uh, how, how the water was moving through, but also the groundwater hydrology, looking at the infiltration rates, and then also people looking at vegetation, and we were looking at, at the birds. Next one. And one of the, of the great things about the puzzle was the social response. So this is the, a bridge in San Luis Rio, Colorado, a town in, in Sonora, just uh, by the border and by the river. And usually here the riverbed is dry, but during the post flow, there was a lot of water and this created a lot of attention in town. Next one. And basically during the period of the post flow, there was a, a festival every day on, on the banks of the river. And this uh, helped to reconnect again the people with the river and create a lot of interest and momentum to continue with the restoration uh, of the Delta. Next. And also I think it was very valuable because for the new, the younger generations, it was the first time for them that saw the river with water. So I think it's, it's very significant. Next one. 
And uh, another significant event, although it was not ecologically that strong, was the connection or the reconnection of the river with the sea. These pictures were taken by Francisco Zamora from Sonoran Institute and with the thanks and the support of from Lighthawk. And on the left, you can see on the top, the river coming down. The bottom part are the tides of the upper Gulf of California. And then two, these, two days later, they finally connected after 30 years of being disconnected. And it was very interesting because it, it, it captured the attention of, of, of news all over the world, this reconnection of the Colorado River with the Gulf of California. Next one. And so what has happened after the, the Pulse Law? Well, we continue with the restoration at different sites, the maintenance and, re and irrigation of these sites. Next one. And also monitoring, you know, tracking the survival and growth of the vegetation and also how habitat is improving and how wildlife is responding. Next. And also releasing base flows into the restoration sites and into the main stem. Next. So just um, getting to some of the responses of the ecosystem to this to this effort. Uh, so to this day, we are about to complete together the different organizations about 1,200 acres of of habitat. But a lot of that is it's very young. No trees are, are still only a few inches tall and, and growing. But we have already about 500 acres that are restored and functional. But also with the post flow and then with some of the base flows, there has been a green up of the floodplain, no, an increase in vegetation biomass. And something very important is that we saw uh, the trend reverted. There, since 2002 and since there has been a drought in the basin, we we were tracking a 13 year downward trend in vegetation biomass in the in the floodplain uh, that was uh, you know birds were following that downward trend too and with the pulse flow that we saw uh, that trend reverting and then we saw an increase in vegetation index ndbi uh, of 43 percent in the flooded area but also 23 percent in the whole riparian zone next one and so getting into, into the birds and what has been the, the response of the birds, um, one of the things that we, could, we have been following as a summary variable is, is bird biodiversity. Um, and and it, this is very important because uh, in the floodplain, uh, which again, dominated by salt cedar, but also in the context of the Mexicali agricultural area, uh, we have high abundance overall, but, um, but birds or the bird community is dominated by four species, uh, morning dove, red-winged blackbird, um, uh, white-faced ibis and gray-tailed grackle. You know? and, and, and together these four birds, they, um, uh, they add up uh, to about 70% of all of the records on, a, on, a, on an average year. So we have a lot of birds, but a lot of those birds are only these four dominant species. And then about other 80 regular occurring species, they only uh, uh, comprise about 30% of the record. So bird diversity gives you a sense, not only of the species richness, how many species we have, but also that balance in the avian community. So, so we, we, we see this as a very helpful tool. And, as I was describing, no, we were following this downward trend in bird abundance and species richness and diversity since 2002. And then in 2014, with the pulse flow, we started to see that change and we saw an increase in bird diversity. And it was not as high in 2015 and 2016, but it was higher than before the, the pulse flow. And we think this is because of the work on the restoration sites, but also on, on uh, the enhancement in the floodplain. Next one. And then getting into some of the uh, groups, uh, of course, with migratory water birds, we saw an amazing increase during the pulse flow. So the Delta is in the migratory corridor and these water birds, they, they, they seem to be very flexible or plastic in their habitat selection. If they see an opportunity, they take it. So they saw, 
the the open water habitat in the floodplain during the post flow when they were they were using it. So we estimate that there were about fifty thousand uh, different water birds uh, in the floodplain during the post flow. And then uh, again, 2015, 2016, not as high as during the post flow. Of course, there is not as much water in the floodplain, but there is more water than before, and so we see an increase in compared with previous years. Next one. And uh, similar with the resident water birds, this, these are birds that nest in the delta. Uh, uh, for example, black crown like herons or snowy egrets or um, killdeer, so snowy plovers. And similar pattern, no? more during the, during the pulse flow and then a decrease over in, in the following years. Next one. And so now getting into the, the response in the restoration sites, and this is where we have seen the, the largest response in, in every category. You know, we have 28% higher abundance, 33% higher species richness, and 53% 53 higher diversity. You know? And this is something very important that we see a much balanced avian community, not as dominated by only a few species. Next one. And then over the years, um, so this is an important uh, aspect. Uh, we have 15 target species that we use as indicator. Uh, and these are more riparian related birds, like yellow breasted chat, vermilion flycatchers, average to whiz, uh, yellow billed cuckoos, and that help us track what, what's going on in the restoration site and in the floodplain. And we have seen an, an increase uh, since 2013. Uh, to 2015 uh, of these species overall in the, in the floodplain and their abundance is much higher in the restoration sites. Uh, we don't see that increase uh, or drastic increase at the restoration sites because it's a little tricky in this moment because we, we have a few sites and then we are adding more sites that are young. So that, that plays a role in, in, the, in how um, suitable the habitat is, no? So we think that over the years as the habitat mature more, we'll see um, uh, larger populations of the target species at the restoration sites. Next one. And just to give you a sense of uh, birds in the restoration sites versus the rest of the floodplain, in blue is in the, uh, the populations in the restoration sites, in gray is in the rest of the floodplain, and for all of these species, we have much larger populations in the, or detections in the restoration sites. So average to whiz, birdings, common yellow throats, song sparrows, western kingbirds, and yellow breasted chats. Next one. So some of the things that we have learned um, is, well, the, the environmental flow releases trigger the green up of the floodplain. But something really important is that we, uh, and this is, comes from the vegetation teams, is that we saw a better response of the vegetation at prepared sites, sites that, for example, where we were expecting some flooding and that were clear of salt cedar, so to allow some room for the native vegetation to come up. And also, of course, at the active restoration sites. Um, something important to add there also is that uh, we can trigger a better vegetation response if we dedicate water to a specific sites using the infrastructure and mimic uh, pulses uh, for a specific ridges where we have priority restoration areas. And we are seeing that the bird populations are responding positively to this revegetation and the active restoration efforts in the Delta. Next one, please. And this is a summary of the progress. We have about 1,180 acres of restored right by forest of different ages. So I was mentioning about 500 are already mature enough to provide habitat. Uh, we have secured water rights for 8,200 acre feet. Uh, we have protected about 37,000 acres of marshes, especially in the Cienega. Uh, we have enhanced flows along 55 river miles in, in Mexico. And over the years, we have planted 350,000 native trees. And in, in the past seven years, we have more than 10,000 volunteers participating in the restoration efforts and events. Next one. 
And in general, for the Delta, uh, we think that, that this regional approach, that science-based, has been very effective. We, we know that we have a regulatory framework and public policies and the interest and support from different stakeholders for restoration. We know that binational cooperation is essential and that is feasible, even in, during complex political times. Uh, we know that water allocation is feasible from different sources and mechanisms the same for protection of the sites and that we have a very resilient ecosystem no? that restoration is possible and we have results in a relatively short period of time next one and we're still celebrating and very happy with the recent signing of minute 323 that extends the the activities of minute 319 for nine years it's similar that it includes um, uh, considerations for drought and shortage and water conservation and again an environmental component with participation from US Mexico and the NGOs this time is for nine years so we are looking forward for uh, more activities more work more restoration and more water next one and that's it uh, if you have any questions or comments I'll be happy to answer them all right, thank you for that. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat box in the go to training window. Um, I'm going to try to avoid opening up the phone lines because we tend to get a lot of background noise. So we'll give you all a second to, to do that. Looks like we have a quiet audience. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I think half of the people have seen this presentation before. OK. So where is the base flow water coming from? So the, the base flow water is uh, comes from the water rights that, that we have acquired in the Mexicali Valley. So these were irrigation rights from farmers that now uh, belongs to the coalition of NGOs and are managed by Restauremos El Colorado. And uh, the water is, we're basically uh, another water user in the Mexicali Valley Irrigation District. We make our water requests and we receive it at the points in the floodplain where, where we request the water. So basically uh, the priority restoration sites. Yeah, if anybody wants uh, a copy, Steve, feel free to, to share it with people. Or sure I can... thing. Um, I'll also make a PDF of it and put it up on the Audubon Arizona website. Um, that'll be coupled with a recording of today's presentation as well. Sure. So following up with, with Kari, um, it, it doesn't flow all the way from Morelos Dam, no. Uh, it's not enough water, we, we wish it, it was that way, but there are portions of the of the floodplain, especially in San Luis, where uh, groundwater is too deep and the uh, soil is too sandy, so that there would be a lot of infiltration. So we move the water through the infrastructure and the farmers have been very generous with us and they have been great collaborators and allow us to use infrastructure to move the water rights. and, and put it where it will have the best environmental benefit. And, and then, yeah, if there is a market, yes, there is a, a market to continue with water acquisitions. And that's what Jamilet Carrillo and the team of Restauremos is, is working on on a, on a yearly basis. So we, we continue with that work. Uh, what percent of the water comes from U.S. and what percent from Mexico, for, from Anne? Uh, so during, uh, for example, for Minute 319, it is the same for Minute 323. Uh, a third of the water will be provided by the U.S., a third by the Mexican government, and a third from the NGOs. So uh, both the Mexican and the NGOs water is from the Mexicali Valley. And actually, that it's, it's, a, it's a little bit, complex to try to respond in a short period of time, but uh, it, part of the water that the U.S. is providing, actually the water that the U.S. is providing for environmental component, 
uh, it's created through water conservation projects funded by the U.S. to save water in the Mexicali Valley. If that if that makes sense. Um, and then Edith asked about the increase in the intensity of monitoring during the the pulse flow. Yes, uh, yes. In, in particular about birds, we did we did. Uh, in addition to the standard protocols uh, for point counts, we also added more surveys along the main stem, especially for the water birds. Looks like we missed one a little bit further up from Jim Ruff. Um, he's interested if there is a market to acquire additional water rights, similar to how you've been doing so far. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, yes, there is a, there is a, a market still, and yeah, Restauremos, uh, part of the work is to continue with this acquisition process. And then Itzel, She's asking if the riparian resident birds will increase with time and restoration maintenance, and with the generalist birds will decrease with time. Actually, that's an interesting question. And I, yes, at the, at the restoration sites, we see an, certainly an increase of the riparian resident birds, especially these priority species. And, and while, while not necessarily we'll see a decrease in the population of the other birds, uh, we see a decrease in their dominance. Um, so a more balanced community. Uh, I think that in many places of the floodplain where actually we are not going to have a, enough influence, uh, yeah, those species are going to, to maintain their dominance. But in places where we are implementing restoration, yeah, we're increasing the, the abundance of of these more uh, native or resident birds or priority birds. All right, well, thank you again. Um, I just want to add that, you know, so much of what you're doing down there from restoration to monitoring to policy work to environmental education is really analogous to what we do here at Audubon and other NGOs on the other side of the border. Um, and it's just really inspiring and invigorating to see that our work is part of a bigger picture. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> and from Ann Wiley, you'll have to... Oh, yeah. <laughs> you want to build that one? Yes, uh, we have the, the, the website of the Raise the River Coalition. So if, if you can visit the website of Raise the River or the Facebook page of Raise the River that you can you can find the links to the Nate. Thank you very much. Good deal. Um, just to close it out, I just want to throw a couple Western Rivers Action Network links up there. Um, most importantly, if you go to that action opportunities page, you will see an action alert um, directed at thanking our governor and our Department of Water Resources for signing Arizona on to the continuation of the Colorado River Agreement, um, and also encouraging them to take some critical next steps that will help us make the most of the historic agreement. Um, and that's all I have. Oswald, do you have anything else to add? No, thank you for the invitation and thanks everybody for joining in. Thanks for being here and thank you to everyone on the line. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.